The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and then I will bless them. In the name of the Lord Jesus, our Messiah, Shalom. I love the Lord's Supper. It reminds me of where we come from and it reminds me of where we'll go. We contain his death until he comes. A memorial of what he did, but an appetizer of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. It will be wonderful if we have an appetizer. Hallelujah. In the meantime, we're going to continue now with our conference. We have two more speaking sessions. Unfortunately, because of certain reasons, a bit of a hiccup in the scheduling, uh, the question and answer time is not really going to be possible. If somebody does have any specific questions for myself or for any of the speakers, please feel free to make the approach personally. But we can't really do a Q&A just because of the constraints of time. It is my blessing and pleasure once again to introduce to you my fellow refugee from mainstream Pentecostalism. <laughs> Our dear friend and brother, Hudson. <laughs> Sorry, brethren, I think I was that hiccup. So, uh, <laughs> forgive me for the hiccups. And uh, just before I continue, it would be remiss to go any further and simply to say thank you all for your attendance and uh, for being so wonderful, particularly to say thank you. Uh, to our hosts on behalf of us all, to Jacob and, and all of the Mario team. Thank you so much for this. I greatly I appreciate being uh, invited to be with you. It's been a joyous and wonderful time. Yesterday morning I explained how and why I believe we're living in a time when the Remnant Church is being made manifest. And then later in the same afternoon, Jacob spoke of, I believe it was seven things which will divide further the true church from the false. Seven things. I hope you're paying good attention. Seven things which will divide the true church from the false, the bride from the harlot. And I do believe that we are living in the times when that separation is already beginning to take place. The remnant church is being manifest. I believe that's why so many of us have escaped and are refugees, and so many of us are here together now finding fellowship one with the other. The separation is taking place. There is a division, true from false, the bride from the harlot. And keeping in mind that our host made it clear that he hoped we would speak more about the positive than the negative, I'd like to spend a little time considering the faithfulness of the bride and how she will be prepared, rather than focusing too much on the infidelity of the harlot and how she will be exposed. So a little more about the faithfulness of the bride and how she will be prepared. Now one of the best ways I discovered how to do this in my own fellowship was to make a study of seven Gentile brides that you will find in the Old Testament. Brides of a characters considered to be types of Christ. Because so often with the Bible, if you truly want to know what is going to happen in the future, you need to look back into the past. Amen. Amen. If you want to know what's going to happen, we'll find many of our answers by studying and looking back into the past. And so I discovered that one of the best ways to find out a little bit about the Bride of Christ, the true Bride of Christ, and how she will be prepared for her bridegroom, was to look back into the Old Testament and make a study of seven uh, Old Testament brides, brides of those who are uh, generally considered to be types of Christ. 
Now let me make this perfectly clear. They were not Christ. That is not what I'm saying. That these characters that we're talking about were not Christ to understand. Nor that the type, or their type, or them being a type of Christ, that type will inevitably fail at some point in their story. Neither does it necessarily that type run throughout their entire life. But nevertheless, we can find a number of characters in the Old Testament who, at least in some way, either by their character or their office, are representative and a type of Jesus Christ, a foreshadow of he or him who was to come. So there are a number of, of characters generally accepted as foreshadowing the person of Christ. Because if we can make such a study, if we can look in to these particular characters who are in some way types of Christ, then perhaps we can also gain some kind of understanding about their wives as being possible types of the bride of Christ. And so it becomes a worthwhile study. And the seven Gentile brides of whom I speak, at least the ones that we study in our fellowship, begin with the first Eve, the wife of Adam, of course, uh, of whom I intend to speak uh, a little more in just a moment. And I won't keep you long this morning just to make the points that I hope to make and conclude some of the themes uh, I think that have been coming out during the course of the service, certainly in some of the things I believe the Spirit has been leading me to share with you today. So I'm going to speak a little about Eve, the wife of Adam. Uh, of course, including the seven Gentile brides, you have to study Rebecca. That's a wonderful study, the wife of uh, Isaac, sought out by Eliezer, Abraham's oldest servant, God's helper, a type himself of the Holy Spirit. Asenath, the daughter of the high priest of Arnon, of whose name means who belongs to or is consecrated to Neth. She, of course, was married to Joseph, one of the more obvious types of Christ, uh, and to whom, of course, uh, his brothers are returned one day. Of course, that's really interesting to study Asenath and to see her, her position and how even she is this Gentile bride and the, the daughter of this uh, high priest of On, uh, even she comes uh, to be this position of being at the right hand of her, her husband. Of course, we have support of the Midianite wife of Moses, Rahab of Jericho, wife of Solomon, the Shul Shulamite wife of Solomon, and Ruth the Moabite, this wife of Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. They complete the seven Gentile brides. And sadly, we just don't have uh, too uh, much time to go into these this morning. And because we don't have much time to go into these this morning, I would strongly suggest that you study them uh, yourselves. Consider making a study of these Gentile brides and see what the Lord would say to you through your study of them. Just for example, and I can't help this, although we're going to talk about Eve, there, there's another. I, I particularly enjoy the study of, of Rebecca, but uh, the one that's always touching, so touching, touches my heart all the time, and uh, is, is the study of Ruth. That's a lovely study. It's one of my favorites. Because in Ruth, we have that wonderful picture of a, a true Gentile conversion. <coughs> Amen. Remember how when Naomi heads home to Judah, and after Orpah has already turned away from Naomi, that's when... Ruth says those words, and I'm sure you love as much as I do. Oh, and they entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also of anything but death parts you and me. Indeed, as Jacob uh, shared with us yesterday... Such things as our relationship with uh, Israel and the Jews will certainly divide the true and false church in the last days. Will you be like Orpah or will you be like Ruth? And I'm sure that you're here today because, like me, you would say, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Amen? So, there are one or two other things. Just can't leave Ruth. I said I want to talk about Eve, but I can't leave Ruth. I mean, just please consider making such a study yourself when you do get home. Ruth, chapter 3, verse 3, always speaks really loudly to me. That's where, of course, now Naomi uh, is going to give some wonderful advice to Ruth on how she uh, should meet Boaz. Boaz, of course, is a type of a Christ by his office because, as we've already said, he is her, her kinsman redeemer. 
Amen? So he becomes a type of Christ by virtue of office, by being the kinsman redeemer. Brethren, you do well to remember Naomi's advice, because it's a lesson for us all. She says, wash yourself and anoint yourself and put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. Ruth chapter 3 verse 3. Wash yourself and anoint yourself, put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. I could preach half a day on that one verse alone. But for now, you just need to consider these things. Washed in the water of the word, anointed the Holy Spirit and robed in the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Amen. It's wonderful truths that we find in studying these Gentile brides. But for now, for the little time I have, let me concentrate on Eve. In fact, before we get on to Eve, I think it probably is necessary that I first start a little bit with Adam, by showing you why Adam <coughs> is considered to be a type of Jesus. So turn with me in your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 5 and verse 14. Because <coughs> I know biblical uh, typology... Uh, some people just need a little bit of, of convincing the validity of this. And I don't want you to think that I've come and made up some strange doctrine by suggesting that all these people are types. We need to be Berean and study the scriptures, amen? amen. So it's not what I tell you this morning, it's what the word of God tells us, it's what the scripture says. So let's have a look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those who have not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Amen? Amen. He is a type of him, he, Adam, that is, who is a type of him who was to come. So from Romans 5.14, we, we discover a teaching that says that Adam is a type of him who was to come. Paul writes that Adam is that type, it's a type of the Christ who was to come, and of course he's referring to Christ. So we can see through this and other scriptures, many of which I know that you know, uh, when you'll find in the Bible, the Bible teaches us that Adam is a type of Jesus. Now turn on further in your Bibles please, to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14. 1 Timothy 2, verse 14. Now as you do, and as you find it again, just let me, because I'm rushing a little this morning, I don't want you to think that I'm in error. I want you also to understand the importance of reading scripture in context. Amen? There's something else that happens uh, in church. People will just take verses out of context and use them uh, inappropriately. So I want you to understand that, that I know the context in which Paul is writing about Adam and Eve here and the position of men and women in the church. But let's investigate it anyway and see what it says. Verse 14. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. So who was deceived? Eve, the woman, was deceived. And who was not deceived? Adam, the man, was not deceived. Have you seen that in scripture before? Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. So let me make something clear for you, because have you ever wondered why Adam ate of the forbidden fruit, even though he wasn't deceived? Because back in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, who is it that God is talking to when he gives the command concerning the fruit uh, which can and cannot be eaten? He's talking to the man. He's talking to Adam. And from verse 17, it, were you to look there, you would understand full well that Adam himself knew well that to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was certain death. Because God himself told him so. So Adam knew that to eat of that fruit would be certain death. Now he ate of it. And yet he wasn't deceived. He still did it. Even though the word of God informed us that unlike the woman, he hadn't been deceived. He still did it even though he knew it would be certain death. Because Adam loved his wife. And he suffered a type, a type of sacrificial death to join her in her sinful condition. 
And in doing so, Adam becomes this type of Jesus. Both become men whose brides have fallen to sin. And both love their brides so much that they're willing to sacrifice their own lives by taking the sin of their loved ones upon themselves, rather than being separated from them forever. Scripture says, through the sacrifice of the first Adam, just as sin came into the world through one man, and by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God, and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. We've just partaken of the Lord's Supper. It's how much he loves us that he laid down his life for us. It was yet while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. For all the sin and fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He laid down his life for us and shed his precious blood for us because he loves us and would not be separated from us forever. Praise the Lord. Here's the gospel this morning. So Adam is a type of Christ who, understanding the consequences of death, took the sin of his wife upon himself and therefore endured a sacrificial death. And therefore, if Adam is a type of Christ, then perhaps, brethren, and I say perhaps because you should be Berean and study this for yourself, then perhaps Eve is a type of the bride of Christ. You see, if the scriptures make it perfectly clear that Adam is a type of Christ, then perhaps Eve is a type of the bride of Christ. So let's look a little more closely at Eve in the time I have left. For it was she, not Adam, who was deceived by the serpent and introduced by Satan to sin. Now we know that throughout the narrative, uh, the creation narrative of Genesis chapter 1, God pronounces everything is good. And so it continues until Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, when for the first time something occurs which is not good. It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Please note, by the way, that the Lord did not say, I will make him a helper the same as him. Now this is important, brothers and sisters, because of some of the heresies that are going around in the church these days. <coughs> he, made, he made him a helper comparable to him, not a helper the same as him. And our new creation, we who were once dead in our sin and transgression, have been made and are being made like Christ, comparable to him, but we are not Christ. Before his resurrection, he is monogenes. He is the only begotten Son. Before his resurrection, Christ is monogenes in the Greek, the only begotten Son. Following his resurrection, he is the prototokos, from which we get the, the word prototype, the first fruit of many brethren. He's gone from being the one and only, now to the first fruit of many brethren. He's gone from being the monogenes to being the prototokos. He is the prototype to which you and I are being transformed. By one degree of glory to another, we have been transformed until we all come into his glorious image. But we are not him. We are hidden in him, and we are being made like him. But let me make it clear, we are not him. When God made Adam a helper, he made her comparable to him. And we are comparable to Christ, and being made comparable to Christ. We must look like him. We must be transformed into the image of him. But we are not Christ. And I said this yesterday, I've heard enough Kenneth Hagin teachings to last me a lifetime. And I hope I never hear another one. <laughs> no matter what he has said, or however many people follow his teachings, we are not any of us Christ's. We are like Christ. But there is only one Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. There is only one Christ who is worthy yes. to be praised. There is only one Jesus Christ worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. Only one who should be lifted up. Only one who should be followed. We may have been made as kings to rule and reign with him. But there is only one King of kings and Lord of lords. His name is Jesus and we are but his faithful followers. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. That said, we also know from Genesis chapter 2 and 18 that we are indeed 
to be his helpers. And many, of course, be alluding to the Great Commission, where we are now to preach the gospel in all the earth. Or perhaps, and I believe this more likely, as I'm talking about the Bride of Christ, to his return and his millennial reign. Yes, he will come back, by the way. That's another uh, heresy sleep in the church that people are getting all confused about. But Jesus will return. Hallelujah. His beautiful nail pierced feet will touch down again. He will be seen once more in the way in which he left. We shall see him come back again. And his feet will touch down on planet Earth. And he will rule and reign for a literal thousand years here in the earth. Glory to God. He is coming. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That which we've done this morning, <laughs> we do in remembrance of what he did, but we also proclaim his death until he comes. Amen. The Lord Jesus is coming. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Very quickly. So he will come. So perhaps about this business of being helpers, maybe it's that we are to preach uh, the good news, the gospel, the Great Commission, while we're here on the earth. Perhaps, and I do believe it's more likely, it is talking about his return in the millennial reign when those who are redeemed to God by his blood out of every tribe, tongue, and people and nation, having been made kings and priests to our God, shall reign with him in the earth. Hallelujah. Now, just like Eve, the wife of Adam, therefore, will be to us, and even to you and I, uh, uh, to you and me, those of us who are men, that just like Eve, the wife of Adam, we shall be to our husband wives, <coughs> helpers, comparable to him. But he shall be our husband, and he will ever be our head over us. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Even so now, the head of the church is Jesus Christ. Yes. But he shall ever be as our husband, our head over us. If we are the bride of Christ, Jesus will ever be our head. Amen. Now to try and conclude all that I've been trying to say over the past couple of days and to provide some uh, further understanding of this uh, thing that I'm calling the manifestation of the end time or the remnant church, the revealing of the bride of Christ, I'd like us to remain in Genesis chapter 2. Remember, we got up to the point where I said for the first time, he said it was not really good. <coughs> now, you can go there if you like, and you can run your finger through the scriptures, but most of you will know the Genesis uh, narrative, the account of those things which I'm going to say, but always good to have your Bible open and make sure the preacher's telling the truth. Amen? Amen. So, in Genesis chapter 2, we understand that God made Adam how? God made Adam from the dust of the ground. In verse 19 of Genesis chapter 2, you're going to see something else. That likewise, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and bird of the air. So he's made man from the dust of the ground. And out of the ground also, he's made every beast and bird of the air. All made from the ground. So when he creates Eve, he does something quite unique. He put Adam into a deep sleep and took one of his ribs and he made it into a woman. And makes woman unique. Everything else had been formed from the dust of the ground. Adam himself, every beast, every bird had been formed from the dust of the ground. But woman, the bride, that's the context in which I'm speaking to you, the bride yeah. of, of Adam was not made that way. <clears throat> she was taken out of the bridegroom. Let me put it another way. The bride of Adam came not from the dust of the ground, but out of Adam. The bride of Adam was taken from that which was in him. Are you hidden in him, brothers and sisters? Yes. Are you hidden in him? Yes. And from this, I think we might discover a distinction and ultimately a separation between the church, much of which, as we heard from Jacob yesterday afternoon, will go on to form the harlot and a separation from the faithful remnant who will become the bride. Because the church, brothers and sisters, is most commonly known as what? The church universe is most commonly known as the body of Christ. The body of Christ. But as for the first Adam, the bride, I believe, will be taken out of the body. 
Just as Eve was born through a wound in Adam's side whilst he was sleeping, <coughs> so too was the true church born from a wound in Christ's side as he was pierced on the cross, as we heard about this morning. The church was truly born when the blood and the water flowed. For Christ redeemed us, the scripture says, by his precious blood with which he bore the church. Whilst the water represents the soon coming of the Holy Spirit, which was sent after his return to glory. Purchased by the blood of Jesus alone and born of the Spirit gives us a picture of the true church. Amen? <laughs> Purchased by the blood of Jesus alone and born of the Spirit will give you a picture of the true church. For most assuredly, in the words of Jesus, I say unto you, unless you are born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You can't even see the kingdom unless you're born again. But you must be born of water and the Spirit if you are to enter the kingdom of God. <coughs> So not everyone, brothers and sisters, who claims to be the church is necessarily the bride. Isn't that what Jesus said? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Jesus himself says not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. There is a separation which must take place. Only those whose names are written in the book of life will inhabit the new Jerusalem and are the bride. And they will be those who are truly born of water and the Spirit. Are you born again? Yes. Are you truly born again? Yes. Born of water and the Spirit? Yes. Have you been to Jesus for his cleansing yes. power? Yes. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Hallelujah. Are you living daily grace this hour. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? And so Eve, the first woman, and indeed the first bride in the Bible, created to be a helper comparable to her husband, becomes a type of the bride of Christ. Hidden in him, not made from the ground, but taken from the side of her husband. Though she was deceived, and he was not. Though in her deception she had sinned, his love for her was such that he gave his life as a sacrifice for her. What does this sound to you if not Christ and the church? Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. So finally, please turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. You'll recognize the scriptures, Ephesians chapter 5, and let's read together from verse 22. And this time, because you'll probably recognize the scriptures from maybe something a minister has said at a wedding service where it's a, a popular passage to be read, this time, let's read it in the context of which I'm teaching this morning, remembering that Paul, as he's speaking, isn't officiating at a wedding. Neither is he primarily, or neither is it primarily, his intention to give marital advice. Because Paul will explain, as you'll see, whilst we're reading the scripture, that he's talking about something quite different. He's talking about something which he's calling a great mystery. Paul is writing in regard to the church's right relationship with Jesus, that of a faithful wife to her husband. This he refers to as a great mystery. Some of this mystery, which I trust, is being revealed to us during the course of this weekend. So as we read it, this isn't so much about how you gentlemen and your wife should behave towards your, uh, your wife, how you should behave towards your wife, I've just heard that so often, you know, and uh, women. This is about how we, each of us, each of us should be behaving toward Jesus and as I said to you earlier, in this, even those of us who are men are wives. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, 
as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Here it comes, verse 32. This is the great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his husband as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Praise the Lord. So verse 33 sums it all up. Following verse 32, in verse 32, he makes it very clear to us that he's not speaking, per se, about marital advice. He's talking about the relationship between Christ and the church. And verse 33 is almost like him saying, you can have this for free, though, because if that's how Christ and the church will be, as like husband and bride, then nevertheless, each one of you also ought to live this way, too. Amen. But he makes it entirely clear uh, at the conclusion of the passage that we read in verse 32, that there is a great mystery involved in this passage of Scripture, and the mystery is this, brothers and sisters, he is speaking concerning Christ and the church, just as I am now, and we have been during these last couple of days. Paul writes, when a husband is joined to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I am speaking concerning Christ and the church. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul teaches this. He says, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Certainly also in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul writes, in order to be an overseer of the church, a man must be the husband of one wife. And I started my testimony yesterday by talking about an old-time Pentecostal preacher. It was no mistake that I told you that he had been married to the same woman for a long time and had many children and grandchildren, all of whom were in church and all of whom loved the Lord. You see, these were basic biblical principles to which we all once oh, adhered, yeah. but which are now being strongly overlooked. That any man who desires to be an overseer, let him be the husband of one wife. That if you are unable to raise your own family in the way of the Lord, Absolutely. what qualifies you yeah. to pastor a large church family yeah. in the way of the Lord? Yeah. Biblical principles and biblical advice, yeah. but sacrificed for some kind of imagined greater anointing That's right. than being faithful to the Word of God yeah. and the teaching of the Bible. Amen. So the Scriptures make it clear. The man should have one wife. So let me ask you a rhetorical question. Wouldn't you think that Paul would also be of the opinion that Christ, being the head of the church, should also have but one wife. And according to Paul, Christ the head is that husband and the church is the bride. I know what some of you may be thinking because I thought this myself as the Lord was showing me through the scriptures these things. I thought, well, Lord, that doesn't make sense because now I've just said that the bride will come out of the church and, and so there's some confusion here because now I'm saying the, 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 the bride of Christ is going to come out of the church, but now you're saying that the church is not just the body, the church is the bride. But you see, I think for Paul, the distinction between faithfulness and unfaithfulness had already been made and already settled in his own mind. 
2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, he writes this, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. <coughs> See, brethren, there is a virgin, a chaste virgin, a picture of spiritual purity, of faithfulness and fidelity. That's the church that he's espoused to Jesus Christ. A chaste virgin, spiritually pure. A picture of fidelity and faithfulness. But there will also be a harlot, a prostitute, a whore, who will fornicate with the kings of the earth. But here's the thing, brothers and sisters, they cannot both be the bride of Christ. For Christ will only have one wife. He will not have a wife, both as a virgin and a harlot. The only one to which he is espoused is the chaste virgin. Revelation 21, Verse 9 describes the new Jerusalem as the bride, the Lamb's wife. Of course, it's not a city per se, for he'll not marry a city. It's descriptive of its inhabitants, those who will live within. Those whose names, it tells us, are written in the book of life. There's only one way for that to happen. You must be born again. Amen. Born of water and the Spirit. You must put your faith fully in the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. They live in a postmodern society where they tell us there is no absolute truth. Yeah. And what's true for you might be different from me, and what's true for me might be different for you. There is no absolute truth, they say. It allows thinking to creep in that there are many roads that lead to heaven, that there are many gods who can be worshipped and you can still find your way there. But I'll tell you this this morning, there is absolute truth. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Praise the name of Jesus. And that, brethren, is the sum of my message, why I left and why I came. I left because I want no part of the harlot. I left because I want no part of the harlot. And I came because I desperately want to be a part of the bride. I truly desperately want to be a part of the bride. I truly want to see Jesus. I want to be the one he comes for, among those he comes for. I'm longing for him to come and take me away. Amen. I'm desperate to we see the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. I am so in love with Jesus. I'm not ashamed to say, I'm like at the flush of first love, I'm giddy in love with Jesus. Hallelujah. So Isn't that the purpose of the letters yes. uh, uh, to the seven churches in Asia Minor uh, when he, he's running to Ephesus and says, but this I have against you, you've forgotten your first love. We can never forget our first love. Amen. We're desperately waiting for him yes. to come back. And he will. We are espoused to him. Yeah. We are espoused to him. And he's gone away to make a place for us. Yeah. In my father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you so. And I go and make a place for you that where I go you may be also. Amen. And you do know the way. Yeah. You do know where he's gone and you know the way. He is the way, the truth and the yeah. life. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Desperate to see Jesus again. Desperate. To see him face to face. Yes. To kiss his face and to love on him. God help me by his grace. Please, Lord, let me remain faithful until that day. Yes. Oh, please. You see, don't become self-righteous people. Yeah. I know I'm at a conference, and I know you're good people, but if I were in my own fellowship now, I'd be telling them round about the time of the Lord's table, do not become self-righteous. 
just because that we feel that by the Spirit of the Lord we'd be drawn out of the apostate church and called out. Are we in some way better than anyone else? Not at all. It's by the grace of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't start becoming self-righteous now and pointing fingers at other people. You continue well in your faith. Amen? By the grace of God, you remain faithful. You walk your walk. You work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You remain faithful until the end. The end of your, uh, so, uh, the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Amen. Yeah. But it's by His grace. And that's why we do this also to remember Him. You see, you need him, and I need him as much today as you did when you first got saved. Oh, yeah. Because we are looking constantly unto Jesus Christ, who is both the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. I need his grace today. Every moment, every waking, living moment of my life, I need his grace. Oh, Lord, help me remain faithful. Amen. I left. Because I want no part of the harlot, I came because I'm desperate to be a part desperate of the bride. Amen. Amen. That brethren is the sum of my message and the reason why I left and why I came. I want to be a part of the bride. Christ will not have many brides. Now is the time for you to put your faith in him, the one who loved you enough to redeem you by his blood. Because I said this yesterday, when I speak to the world, I introduce them to Jesus the best as he enables me. When I speak to the church, I tell them to prepare themselves. Get ready. Jesus is coming. You don't want to be found foolish and unready. Jesus is coming. Maranatha. And we're waiting for him, expectantly, looking for him. And my prayer for you, as I conclude, is the same as it is constantly for myself. Please, Lord, keep me faithful. Amen. So I spoke yesterday from the book of Jude. Although I didn't begin with a prayer, I'm going to end with one of my favorite prayers in the Bible, that of Jude. Mm -hmm. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, falling eh? and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, yes. dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Very briefly, and we are trying to keep the lunch schedule. Uh, we'll have a 10 minute break, a 10 minute break, it's either that or we distribute catheters, so I have to... <laughs>